Good morning. Let's sing together and hand it be. One, two, three, four, five, six. amazing love that really is astonishing who are we not just that you should die for us that you should suffer on the cross for us please bless us in this hour help us to come to you boldly as we just sang with great confidence that we can come near because jesus christ our great high priest still intercedes for us i just bless us in this hour as we seek to give you praise and offer you our lives in jesus name we pray amen Good morning and welcome to worship the Williamsburg Community Chapel as we begin our new summer Bible study series, Recover. I'm so grateful that we get to worship Jesus Christ who has covered us through his sacrifice for our sins. I would like to let you know about several opportunities for you and your household to connect with Christ and his community here at our family of faith. The first is through our weekly chapel family picnics, which are happening every Tuesday evening, right outside under the portico and under the tent. You can join many people from our chapel family Tuesdays from 6.30 to 8. It's a great time of free food, great time of fellowship, worship, and learning from God's word together. We simply ask that you visit wcchapel.org slash events where you can register each week for the family picnics that you are able to come to. It's a great time. My family and I attended this past week. It was a wonderful time with the chapel family. Our next opportunity is our first ever VBS, family VBS, here at the Williamsburg Community Chapel. What that means is that you and your entire household, not just elementary school age children, but you and all of your children and all of your family are invited to come to our first ever Family VBS, which will be taking place July 26th through the 30th, 5.30 to 7.30 every evening that week. We'll be having free food, we'll be having a time of games and crafts, a time of singing, and a time in God's Word learning together. So I hope that you and your household will join us for our Family VBS the last week of July. Visit wcchapel.org slash VBS for more information and register for the evenings that you can join us that 
week. Our final opportunity to connect with Christ and one another is through digital devotion and prayer. We have an updated summer schedule for DDNP, as we're calling it. It's every Wednesday morning from 9 to 9.20, and it will be under the tent here right outside of the chapel's main door. If you can't join us in person, because we really do hope that folks will come for in-person corporate prayer, we are also streaming our digital devotion and prayer times through our website and our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Please visit wcchapel.org slash digital devotions for more information. As we prepare for a time of prayer, continuing in our time of worship here this morning, I would like to read the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 11, and then pray for us and invite you to join me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Romans 8, 11 reads, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this new series, this new summer Bible study on recover, recognizing the ultimate recovery that you have initiated through your Son, Jesus Christ, of rescuing us, redeeming us, restoring us, and recovering us by forgiving us through our sins, of our sins through Jesus Christ, we are grateful for the privilege we have to worship. We are grateful as we think about the exciting opportunities to connect with you and one another here at the chapel. I pray that as we engage in our time of worship here this morning, you would meet us, you would minister to us, you would draw us closer to you so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth for your glory and our good. Now, Father, we pray the words that our Lord Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Isaiah tells about the time when he saw the king high and exalted in these words from Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. When we worship the Lord, we recognize our need for cleansing. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we receive the cleansing that God has made for us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. In worship, we hear God calling, who will go, whom will I send? And we respond, here I am, send me. Like Isaiah, our natural response to God's holiness and God's love is for us to give ourselves back to God in response. Part of that giving is uh, the way we give our tithes and our offerings. And we're so very grateful for the generosity of our congregation, for the way God has moved on your heart uh, to give during this time. 
And uh, there are several options for doing that. If you're here on uh, Sundays, of course, the, the boxes are at the back of the sanctuary where I'm seated now. Uh, but you can certainly stop by during the week to drop your offering in the uh, mail slot where the library is, at the receptionist desk, or you can mail that in. And whichever manner you choose to give, we're grateful for your generosity and grateful for God who has been so very generous to us. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord God, as we have sung about your holiness and about your majesty, uh, we are in awe that you would love us so very much, that you sent your Son to pay the, the pain, penalty for our sin and to atone for our sins. In joyful adoration, we respond by worshiping you and by offering to you our, our lives and all that you have given to us. And so we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, and we pray that each day would be a day that we would worship and bow before our Savior. For it's in his blessed name we pray. Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read verses 7 through 13 and then skip ahead to verses 20 and 21. Let's read God's word together. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Moving ahead to verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was 14 years old and a freshman in high school, I got to travel to Florida with my friend Eric to visit his grandparents. Eric's family and I spent spring break in Florida visiting his grandparents. It was awesome. And one of the best parts about it was that they had a golf cart. And when you're 14 and you're with one of your best friends and you have a golf cart that you can drive all around this retirement community, well, I'm not sure it gets much better than that. It was one of these weird three-wheeled golf, golf carts. I mean, the year was 1990 but it had two rear tires and then one really fat front tire in the middle. We rode that golf cart everywhere. Well, about halfway through vacation, just as we were parking the golf cart in the garage for the night, Eric, who was driving, accidentally hit the accelerator instead of the brake, and the golf cart lurched over the barrier that was meant to stop it, and the front tire hit the drywall. Well, that's a bit of an understatement. The front tire embedded itself in the drywall of Eric's grandmother's garage. We were panicked. We put the golf cart in reverse and then we went to work. We cleaned up every piece of drywall that we could find and then we found things in the garage that we could lean against the hole that we had just created in the wall. We went into the house silent and we confessed nothing. Much to our surprise and our joy, that night we heard nothing. And so the next morning when we woke up, we went joyriding again. We assumed we had gotten away with everything. We had covered it up. No one would ever know. But that very next day, as Eric was parking the golf cart again, he once again hit the accelerator instead of the brake. And this time he must have hit it with even more force because if we thought we made a hole the first time, 
This time, the front tire buried itself in the wall. And the shelf right above the tire where the battery charger sat, well, that shelf collapsed and the battery charger scraped the front of the golf cart. Once again, we panicked. We cleaned up the drywall. We managed to figure out how to rehang the shelf on the wall and get the battery charger back where it was. We used some spit in our t-shirts to polish the front of the golf cart. And once again, we covered up the hole, hoping no one would notice. But that night we heard the words that we didn't want to hear. We heard Eric's grandmother. We heard her say, boys, hey boys. We walked outside the house into the driveway and stood in front of the open garage where the grandmother was looking at the golf cart. We admitted nothing. She looked at us with these incredibly kind eyes. She looked at us sort of begging us to tell the truth. And she just said, did you guys by any chance accidentally put a hole in the wall with the golf cart? No, 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 no way, said Eric. Are you sure, Eric's grandmother said, is it possible that maybe you accidentally put a hole in the drywall? No. It wasn't us, for sure. She looked at us a little more closely. She paused a little longer this time. And then she said, begging us to tell the truth, she said, hey guys, maybe, maybe you accidentally hit the wall and you didn't even notice, and that's why you didn't say anything. You think it's possible that you could have hit the wall and not noticed you hit the wall and that's how this hole got here? And then I said something that still 31 years later in my life, I regret saying. I looked at Eric's grandmother in the eyes and I said, do you think it's possible that maybe you accidentally drove the golf cart into the wall and you didn't notice and that maybe it was you who did it? Yeah, maybe you put the hole in the garage. Eric's grandmother looked at me for a long time, and then she just said, No, I didn't put that hole in the wall. Believe it or not, that's the last she ever spoke of it. She never brought it up again, and we never admitted to anything. But I will say... That the next day when we were driving that golf cart around, it wasn't fun anymore. I felt horrible, sick to my stomach. I even avoided Eric's grandparents for the rest of the trip. I wanted to go nowhere near his grandmother. I certainly couldn't make eye contact with her. It was hard to even be in the same room. You see, when we cover things up, it never works. When we cover things up ourselves, the cover-ups always fall short. I think there's actually a biblical principle. Cover-ups kill. Cover-ups kill. Now, when I think about cover-ups, I can think probably that all of us have a story like mine in our lives. We put a scratch in our parents' car and we covered it up. We put a scratch in our parents' new hardwood floor and we covered it up. We broke a dish unloading the dishwasher and we didn't tell anybody. We covered it up. We all have cover-up stories like that, but I think we also have other things that we cover up in our lives, other more serious things. I think sometimes we have pain and guilt and shame and fear, and we cover those things up. We cover those up with alcohol, with spending and buying things, with binging shows on Netflix all night. Sometimes, like me, we even cover up our pain or our guilt or our fear with a bowl of ice cream. Yes, there's those kinds of cover-ups. 
Sometimes we have relational problems with our spouse or our friends or someone in our family, and we cover that up as well. We try buying flowers or a fancy gift. or We go on a special trip. We try to cover it up. Sometimes we just stop texting people back and we don't answer phone calls. We ghost them and we just cover it up. But cover-ups kill. Sometimes we have financial problems and we just keep charging our life to the credit card. We cover it up. But cover-ups kill. And of course, our sin our weakness, our faults, the things that we hope nobody else ever finds out about in our lives, well, we cover those up too. Oh, we really make sure we cover those up. But if we look at this passage of Scripture today, we have to be convinced that cover-ups kill. Look at this passage right here that we go to. Look right at verse 7. It's the ultimate cover-up, the first cover-up, the great cover-up. Right in verse 7, we read, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They literally covered themselves up. They literally covered it up. They had just sinned. They had just decided that their way was better than God's way. They had just gone outside his design and disobeyed his commands. Their eyes were open. They were filled with shame and guilt, and they covered it up with fig leaves. They made clothes to cover it up. But as we keep reading in this passage, cover-ups kill. Look at this with me. The the first thing they do is cover-ups kill our relationship with God. Look at verse 8 with me. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Now, Now, walking in the garden, I mean, this could be a literal reality that God was walking in the garden with them. I, I like to think... That's my dog barking. I'm sorry. I'm not going to try to cover that up. It's just going to happen. Hey, Moose. I like to think that God walked in the garden with them. I like to think that they were in great relationship with God because they were. And this walking idea in Scripture is just that. It's the idea of being in great relationship. In Scripture, when you walk with somebody, you are in an intimate relationship with them. And when God comes down into the garden in the cool of the night to walk with them, to be in relationship with them, what do they do? We read that the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves. God wanted to walk. God wanted to be in relationship. And they ran from God. When we cover up ourselves, when we try to cover up our sin and our shame and our guilt, our fear and our pain, when we cover these things up, we end up running from God. And if we run from God, well, then we'll never be walking with him. Cover-ups kill, and cover-ups kill our relationship with God. Adam and Eve hid in the trees, the very trees that God gave them to nourish their bodies and their souls. They used them to hide from God. Cover-ups kill. But cover-ups don't just kill our relationship with God. Cover-ups kill our relationships with each other. Look at how these two begin to act with one another. God comes and asks them, hey, Where are you? What's going on? Did you eat of the tree that you were commanded not to? In verse 12, we read, The man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with, she 
she gave me the fruit to eat, and I ate. <laughs> Look how Adam throws his wife under the bus. It wasn't me got it. It was Eve. It's her fault. God turns to Eve and says, what did you do? And Eve turns to the serpent. The serpent deceived me. It was his fault, and I ate. There is division between them. They are blaming and excusing for the other. It's amazing. This relationship that they had, this perfect partnership, now broken. I mean, literally, as they covered themselves up with fig leaves, they were now in a place where they were controlling how much the other person got to see and know of them. This relationship that had been this beautiful, open, intimate, vulnerable relationship now is a relationship of control and power. God says that later when he puts his curse on them. He says, the desire shall be for you, your husband, and he shall rule over you. Cover-ups kill relationships. Now in our relationships, when we cover things up, we, we have relationships that are about control and power and limiting how much somebody knows or doesn't know. Our shame keeps us from wanting to be fully known and keeps us from being fully known by others. Cover-ups kill. They kill our relationship with God. They kill our relationship with each other. But the good news is that's not the whole story. The good news is that God recovers them. That God recovers them. We read it in verse 21. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothe them. You see, cover-ups kill, but God's recovering restores us. God's recovering restores us. There is so much about these garments to think about. One, it was just such a gracious, merciful act for God to do this. I mean, he was kicking them out of the garden. Literally, he drives them out of the garden because of their sin. And yet, they're only wearing fig leaves. That wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't protect them from the elements. It wouldn't sustain them. It wouldn't uh, keep them safe. It wouldn't be practical. So even in that sense, these clothes that God's made are a gift of mercy and love and grace as he looks out for them, even as they are kicked out of the garden. But we also know that Scripture doesn't say that he made these clothes out of cotton. He didn't make these clothes out of linen. No, he made these clothes out of animal skins. Something had to die. An animal's blood had to be shed. The cost of of writing their wrong was very great. And this verse is a foreshadow to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, because animal skins would never be enough to restore them. No, animals being sacrificed in the Old Testament sacrificial system, they would never be enough to fully restore people. No, we know that these skins point forward to Jesus Christ himself. That in order for Adam and Eve and for you and me to be restored, then Jesus Christ, God himself, would have to die. That on the cross, Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God. He was stripped naked so that we could be clothed in righteousness. He was covered in sin so that we could be covered in his blood. He was covered in darkness so that we could be enveloped in light. He was cast out like Adam and Eve 
so that we could be let back in. He was killed so that we could have life. You see, cover-ups kill, but God's recovering restores. God's recovering restores. You know, as we begin this summer, we're in a series that we are calling Recover. Because as we think about all that our community, our nation, our world has gone through, through this pandemic, everyone is talking about a recovery. But our concern is that we're just going to cover up all that we've experienced instead of allowing God to recover and restore us. And so this summer, we, we look to recover together, to allow God to redress us, to recover us, to restore us as he did Adam and Eve. You know, when people ask me about this past year, I have to be honest. This past year was the hardest year of my life. Our family lost some dear friends. My wife had a 16-hour surgery with a two-month recovery. Online school was more difficult than we thought it would be. Our family, our children felt the effects of isolation. My kids' friendships became more difficult. It was a hard season. Susie and I have said to each other that we're calling this the summer of health and healing. But the only way that we're going to move into health and healing is if we allow God to recover us. Because our instinct, our instinct is to cover it all up. The pain, the hurt, the frustration, the shame, the guilt the relational tension, all the things that we have felt through this season, our inkling is to always cover it up, but cover-ups kill. But God's recovering restores. I want to go back to my 14-year-old self, and I just want to say, tell the truth. Tell Eric's grandmother the truth. You know, God does what Eric's grandmother does in Genesis chapter 3. He asks these questions of Adam and Eve. Where are you? He says, our all-knowing, all-powerful God knows exactly where Adam and Eve are, but he just wants them to admit it. They don't even admit it well. They say, oh, we were naked, so we hid That wasn't the problem. The problem is they were disobedient. The problem is they sinned, but they tried to cover it up. And God says, is it possible that you ate from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And they still only blame each other and blame the serpent. No, the recovery starts when we are honest. The recovery starts when we're willing to tell the truth. Cover-ups kill. But God's recovering restores. And as we head into this season of recovery, my hope and prayer is that we can be honest. That we can honestly say, God, I've tried to cover up. I've tried to cover up my sin, my pain, my fear, my frustration, my isolation, my relational problems. I've tried to cover them up and hide them all. But God, I need you to recover me. God, I need you to recover us. In Psalm 32, David writes, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And then David writes, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said instead, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The beautiful truth is that God is in the garden looking for us. That God came to earth looking for us, to walk with us, to be in relationship with us us. But cover-ups kill. But God's recovering restores. Will you enter this season of recovery together with us by admitting that you need God's recovering? That the fig leaves you've made in your life, they're just not enough. We need God to recover us. Cover-ups kill, but the good news is that God's recovering restores. In this season, if you're feeling the pain and the hurt and the shame of cover-ups in your life, then reach out. We would love to walk with you, pray with you, serve you in any way that we can. But we know that the Word of God is true, and His promise remains and as I read in Psalm 32 in the sermon, if we, can, if we confess our transgressions to the Lord, He will forgive the iniquity of our sin. Let us stop trying to cover up the messes in our lives, but instead let us surrender to the God who recovers us in His righteousness and restores our souls for him. Go in peace.